Let's turn to hurling because what a weekend it was and what a weekend we have in store as well. James Scahill is with us. James, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, guys. How are you keeping you good? So the, um, let's start with the, the Limerick performance and the Tipperary performance because I'm really interested in how a swing like this happens in a match and now that the, the dust has settled and we've, we've got a little bit of time to um, digest what happened. Um, a, a couple of things. What, uh, what did happen? How were Tipperary able to be so dominant in the first half? Uh, what do you think happened in the dressing room and how the hell did Limerick pull that performance out in the second half when they looked like a completely different team? Yeah, it was first of all it was a great game. I think it was one of the best games I've, I've actually I've actually ever seen in my life. You know what I mean? Um, it was just it was a, a super game of two halves. Um, Tipperary implemented their game plan from the off. Let's say so they, they got the ascendancy. Uh, they were winning the arm wrestle from from the, the first minutes the game started. And you know a big thing with Tipperary was, was they were winning their own puck outs. Uh, normally when Limerick are are in this in the ascendancy in games, they're winning the opposition puck outs and they're playing a game within within the games on, on their puck outs. So. Tip, uh, they, they chose to go along a good bit, and what they were doing was they were winning an awful lot of their own breaks. Um, so you'll see that when when Hogan was hitting the ball, it was travelling in excess of 90, 100 metres. It was a great, great workout. So what Tip were doing was they were positioning themselves in positions that they could come on to breaks, um, and they were putting people left and so, left and right and in front of the breaks, so they were kind of creating chances. Hence how kind of the two goals came about. So when the ball is travelling, it's travelling in the air for probably four to five seconds. So the Tipperary guys were positioning themselves about 20 odd metres away from where the ball was going to land. They knew where it was going to land, it was going down the middle. It was obviously signalled by Hogan. And then you just see the likes of Bubbles coming through, uh, like, he, like he did for, for the goal. He was positioned 20 odd yards away from where the ball actually landed on the puck out, got the break, and he was through because he was coming at pace. And I think what happened then, uh, in the first half, then Chip were just, everything was going well. It was probably the best half of hurling they had since the 2010 second half from the beat to Kinney. Um, and like it's, when things are going well and there's fist pumping and there's chest pumping, you know, you, you, you need to make hay <laughs> when the sun is shining, do you know what I mean? You need to get as, as far ahead as possible. And I, I just think at, at, at half time, what happened was Paul Knurk got his hand on the Limerick team uh, from a tactical perspe perspective. John Kiley got his hand on the Limerick team from a, from a probably a motivation, mental perspective. And they just kind of fixed it up. So what Limerick came out is they came out an entirely different team from a setup. Um, they forced the game within the game for the puck outs so that when Hogan did go long, Limerick got numbers around the breaks. And when you start winning the breaks, again, you 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 force the game within the game. You, you made Hogan go short in for puck outs. And that's how Limerick's score came about. So you see Hogan had to go short. They turn him over. Uh, Galan then drops off, which is an excellent piece of you know of in-game knowledge to say that not nine-tenths of forwards, when that play develops, will get sucked into the play to try to win the ball. Galan backs off and creates a space for himself, creates an, an, an opening for himself, which, which then becomes an easy pass from Hegarty. And, you know, the shot was, was, was a great save from Hogan. But there's Flanagan again, coaching for the goal. I just think Limerick fixed, they fixed their defence and got numbers around the breaks. Uh, they fixed the opposition puck out and got numbers around the opposition puck out breaks and forced them to go short and then turn them over. Uh, and then they had Keane Lynch. You know, Keane Lynch is probably, um, now I, I haven't been around to see them, but I think as it stands right now, Keane Lynch is probably the best Limerick player ever, you know. And his ability to, he, he doesn't play in the present, if that makes sense. He kind of plays in the future. So he is analysing the game ahead of everybody else. He's a step ahead. And like his ability to 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 kind of motivate himself to get to a position or get to a pass, get open for a pass is unbelievable. And like he's just uh, he's you know, he was he was a huge huge reason why Limerick turned it over. Well, let's, look, there's loads in that, and we'll tease through some of it. But let's just luxuriate in Keane Lynch for a moment. Explain to me a little bit about how him playing in the future works. What what what, what when you see well, it, what does it mean? Uh, there's a book. There's a book called "Be the Best You Can Be in Sport," and it's by Paul Keegan. And in the book, there's a chapter where he's, he talks to Paul Knurk. And Paul Knurk talks about self-talk. Uh, he calls it self-talk, where, whereby you're in the game and you're motivating yourself to, to get to a pass, to get, to, or get open for a pass, and get into a piece of space to offer an easier opportunity for your, for your teammate to pass the ball to you. So, like, some players, they'll stay where they are. You know, the ball will come down between their, themselves and the opposition. It's a 50-50 ball. I just see Keane Lynch. He's looking around himself the whole time, trying to find a pocket of space to give himself an easier pass. And he's always there in support. So he's like a phase ahead, maybe a phase or two ahead. That's why you always see him on the ball, always. Like, it's rare you see him get turned over. It's rare you see him get, uh, you know, get dispossessed because he's always creating space for himself. He's, and he's he's two-sided. He's such skilled. So, like, he, he's... he's I would feel that Keelan is in the game. He's in the moment. And he's kind of always looking around him. He's tuned in for 75 minutes to see how can I put myself in a better position to turn over... Uh, to, to get uh, to get the ball from my teammates, he's never involved in any fracas. He's never involved in any kind of off the sh off the ball or, or you know in 
kind of shoulder and that kind of stuff, bravado stuff. He's always looking for the ball to, to take the team forward. And like that now, as I said, when things go well for you, it's, it's easy to do the things right. But when things aren't going well for the team, that's the hardest time ever to keep motivated, to keep the head in the game. Because all you want to do, some, the devil on your shoulder is telling you just to give up. You know, and so when Keane Lynch, when Limerick are, are still 10 points down and he's dragging the game out, dragging it out, dragging it out, that's him in, in the moment, self-talking himself to get to a future phase. So he's trying to create something for, for the Limerick, Limerick uh, halfback of midfield. It's exactly what he did. And you see Will O'Donoghue and Gareth, Gareth Donovan and Declan Hannan found him with how many link balls. And who was the man that passed the ball to Kyle Hayes? You know, he was down his own 45-yard line, passed the ball to Kyle Hayes, opened up a channel, and we saw one of the best goals ever. It really was one of the best goals ever. Like it was as good a thing that you'll ever see in any sport at any point in any of our lives. It's a remarkable thing. And as, as I think Eddie Brennan did a good, good bit of analysis on it, he was like, "Look at Glan's run. Glan runs towards, you know, taking out uh, Paddy Marr, who all of a sudden has left this big hole behind him, and then it's like, uh oh, the Red Sea has parted." Yeah, it's just I, it's it's terribly hard hard to articulate in the sense that. Uh, like Galan just he opened up a channel for him, you know. And like people watching the game will obviously be will be absolutely honed in on Kyle Hayes watching the run he's making. But they don't see the rest of the Limerick guys just creating a, a dummy run, if you like to call it that, that opens up, as you said, the Red Sea. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And Kyle Hayes has a free run through on goal. That's his second time with that. Now he did that against Cork as well before half time in their first game. The only way to stop him, if I'm honest, right, is tripping. Just follow him. Do you know, when he gets the ball back his own half half back line and he sees open, open country, knock him down. <laughs> just take, knock him down, take a card, and you know set off again because that that kind of goal, <laughs> you know that kind of goal just you know that's a huge hammer blow to Tipperary. And once that goal went in, that was it. They're yeah. never coming back. I was making the point though that uh, every time he gets the ball in the half back line, now that's a clear goal scoring opportunity. So if you do take him down, technically it should be a sin <laughs> and a penalty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, we won't go there again. You know. No. Uh, okay, so can I just ask about Galan not starting? Like, is that? Is that, is that an error on, on Limerick's part in retrospect? And, and one that maybe if they lose the game, everybody's like, what the hell's going on? Or, you know, when you, when you win, every decision you made was perfect and everything worked really well. So, like, what's the truth in that? Do you think John Kiley is looking at himself going, I got, a, I got away with that a little bit? There could, be, there could be numerous reasons why, um, why he got dropped um, or why he wasn't starting. Uh, one it could be solely on form. It could be solely on form that Graham McGahey was completely out form in training. And you know, some managers. I'm, I'm not going to speak for John Kiley, but for me personally, you need to be performing in training. You have to train to play. So if you can't produce this in training, you can't produce it produce in the game. And I, just, I, I wonder what kind of form Galan was coming into uh, dur during that process. And then you, you don't know what happens. Could there be an off the field issue? Could he have missed, you know, some sort of a physio appointment? Something small could it have turned John Kiley towards towards Graham McGahey. But I, I do think that say halfway through the first half he was he was itching to get him on. But you can't bring him on too soon because that could you know impact the confidence and the overall team morale of, of Graham. You know because like if you take him off after ten minutes, fifteen minutes, you know, that that could essentially be his his own year finished in, in, in you know, mentally in his own head, and um, because he'd be, he essentially could be wondering what what service could he offer to the team. So like bringing him on close to half time was probably the right call. But then when when when, when he came on. Like he just offered so much to Limerick. He's such a, he's a threat on the high ball. He's a threat for creation space. He's a nightmare uh, to mark for the shooting because he can shoot off either side. He takes on shots that, you know, I, I, sometimes I was saying, why did you shoot that? The next thing goes up, you know. Um, so like he's just he's he's one of the top class forwards. You know, if you look across Limerick or across nationally, and you put people in the top top class bracket, there's probably only seven or eight forwards nationally that are in top class bracket. And he's one of them. Yeah. So it, it's, <laughs> I don't think he's going to miss the start of a game again for the rest of the year. Now, who knows, maybe John Kiley sticks to his guns and goes, well, you know, the starting team, yeah. start, I'm not sure. You'd expect him to start the next game, all right. Um, yeah. So from Limerick's perspective, is there any danger in having peaked in a uh, Munster final? We've seen before, Munster champions don't always win the All-Ireland. Like, there was a long period of time there where they didn't. Uh, like, is there any, any possibility that actually what, what's happened now is... All of those changes that Canark made, all of that tactical shift, the opposition are sitting there watching the video going, OK, well, we actually do have a man marker who's going to be able to mark Keane Lynch. We, we have somebody who's going to stand on his toe metaphorically and get under his skin, and that's how we're going to beat this team. Is there enough, or <coughs> is there, is there enough time for anybody who's out there to build a team to beat this Limerick team for the rest of this yeah. season? 
I, I think this year, there's, no, there's not. I don't think anyone's going to beat Limerick. I think in, in previous championship years where you had a good a good long break between games, you would have some chance to, to create a bit of passion or play or create a game plan that could take them down. Um, the fact that the Limerick are going to go in now with, with essentially a break, we're, we're, we're actually classing two weeks here as a break, you know, that's, or three weeks, that's, that's, that's how strange it is because the, 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 the championship is so compressed. Um, a, a big thing for me is that when, when Chip were going well, everything was going well. I mean, everything, you know, so it was a bit like a boxing match whereby the heavyweights were going boxing and Chip were landing all their punches, everything. And Limerick wouldn't fall down, and Limerick came back and knocked them out. And I think that's going to do. I, I I'm not going to say irreparable damage, but like, there's an awful lot of damage now to don't that Tipperary team because they threw absolutely everything at Limerick, and they didn't come up trumps, and they were bowled over in the third third quarter. So after throwing their best punches, and that's nearly a repeat of what happened in the 2019 Munster and the Munster Championship. So you know, for Tip themselves, I, I it's very hard how they see how 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 they come back against Limerick. I think they'll be hoping to God someone locks Limerick out and they get someone else in the final if they get that to her. And for everybody else, th- there is a blueprint of a passion or play there for, for, for them to copy. The only thing is, it's a high octane, high energy, huge success rate of passing has to go has to go right for you before you can turn over Limerick. And, you know, you, you look at uh, the game, first half, tip every single ball is going to hand. It's, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Breaks are landing their way. The scores are coming for them. They're getting opportunities through on goal. Like Limerick, Limerick don't concede goals. You know, some said they don't they don't score goals, but they don't concede goals and they concede two, three. So like, I, I don't think that's going to happen again. So again, the game was good for Limerick. They won the Munster final. But Knurk and Kylie will be looking at it going, right, what actually happened? What can fix? So when they have time to actually fix their own issues uh, off, the, off what the pattern of play to tip developed against them, you know, they're going to get stronger, I think. And I don't think motivation is a question or complacency with this team because they're, I think their leadership and their management is second to none. It seems like history is a motivation for them, making history and continuing to drive standards in the way that it was for the great Kilkenny team. Because, you know, like, I remember we did a show down in Kilkenny and had one of the former Kilkenny players on who was like, ah, look, if we win or lose, it doesn't really matter. This is Kilkenny, we're going to win All-Ireland at some point. Uh, that's, not, mm. that's not true for this Limerick. That's not the, the uh, era in which they grew up in. But it's going to be the case now for the next couple of years that if you make that Limerick team... You know, like the Dubs, you're almost guaranteed to be an All Ireland contender, and that that has its own internal momentum when it comes to yeah. driving standards and just inspiring people. Yeah, it's like you you um you know you you become part of one of, one of the cogs in the wheel, one, one of the links in the chain. Uh, like when you come into you, you mentioned Dublin there when you said about like for people coming to that team, they are they, they had Jim Gavin let's say over them. They had a plethora of players who who had huge standards going around. So if you're if you're a young guy coming to that team, there's no messing. You're either in or you're out. And if you're in, you're all in. And if you're out, like you're no loss. So I think with Limerick at the minute, they're going through a fantastic purple patch. Like I remember Ali Canning said it before at one of the Ireland's for Portumna. He said, We know, we understand. He said, We have a generation of players here that are that are you know, few and far between and they don't come around. So we're trying to win as much as we can, as fast as we can. And they came through with six, seven count cycles for Ireland. I get that sense from from Limerick. They have three months months titles in a row, a couple of our Ireland's. And they're trying to win as much as they can, as fast as they can, because they know they will be clipped someday, um, you know, and taken down. But it's just can they win as much as they can? And I see every every young guy that comes into that panel now is conditioned; he's ready to play. So the, there's a couple of guys that copped and they come in. He said he's doing the leave and search. He looked about 25. You know, the size of him. You know, he's he was he's a huge man. So every player that comes into that group knows. Not alone have I chance for success, but for me to remain in the panel, I have to be in the best condition physically and mentally to even contribute and stay there. So. I think they're in a kind of a golden era. If, uh, now they've, they've won two rounds, but I think like with Limerick the way they are, with the age group, the age profile, and if they keep the management group in place, you could be looking at five, six. You know, that's what that's what they're capable of winning. Uh, it's funny. Kieran Carey was on the show and he compared them to Dublin, saying they're ready to do a, a four in a row or a five in a row. And people were like, ah, but actually, you know what? I can see exactly why he would have been confident like that. And the other mm-hmm. thing is that they've had their Donegal moments, like losing to Kilkenny in the All Ireland semi final a couple of years ago. Which, you know, in retrospect, if the 40, if the, uh, they were supposed to get a 65 at the end of the game, if that had happened, it would have been a draw, it would have been extra time, who knows what the hell yeah. would have happened, like the aging Kilkenny team versus the rampaging young Limerick team, who bets against that? Uh, yeah. but, but that setback, I'd say, was like a, a, a massive blow and it prevented the complacency that other great teams have had. Yeah, yeah, fully agree, because sometimes you need to take a, a massive step backwards before you can go forward. And... Uh, that game, that game came came at a good time because it, it became it came at a relatively young, uh, yeah, or sorry, early stage in their, in their in their whole journey. So like that was only on year two, you could say, um, 
uh, of their of their kind of their their, their rise towards greatness, you want to call it that. And like, if it happened now, I think it would be much more detrimental to them than it was back then. It was a good thing; it put them on the road to success, and it kind of it it, it taught them more so than anything. Because the, if you if you win a game, you win, and if you lose, you learn. So they've obviously they lost that game. They learned an awful lot from it. Obviously, in game of of a complacency issue and and of how to start off a game. And it set them. It set them on the road, you know. And then you look at the, the team profile. They've got a great leader in, in Jack Cam, who just boosts class, you know. <laughs> to be honest, they have a great management side, and they have a squad that are full of energy. Seventy-three minutes gone on the final on the game the last day, and they're still going around like March years. You know, the stone didn't affect them whatsoever, and it just looked like the Tipperary were tired. And, and the Tipperary type of guys in, you know, the Seamus Cannon, the Jason Fords, when they're getting the ball, it looked kind of laboured, trying to turn and get away from Limerick, where they just Limerick just kept having energy. They kept. They looked at Peter Casey towards the end of Pat Ryan. You know, they just kept having energy. And I, I can't see how anyone stops that energy because they'll remain in the condition they're in um, as long as they keep the heads focused, you know. Well, let's talk about some of the other contenders who are still alive. Um, Clare are really interesting in that uh, definitely some people were like, oh, Clare are one of those teams who will pose a completely different challenge to Limerick. But let's talk about Clare as, as a team on their own. What did they do against Wexford that allowed them to get off to that great start? Was part of that Wexford's... Um, inadequacies in terms of how they lined out or in terms of how they competed for the ball. What, what, what caused that? That game wasn't over, but it was essentially the winning and losing of it was those first 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I think Wexford, remember last week I spoke about responsibility for the player. Um, and I, and what, I, what I mean by that now is, is during the game, let's say, Fitz, he was up in the, in the stand for the first 12, 13 minutes, okay? So he, he essentially left Wexford their own device on the pitch and it completely went, went awry. It was, it was backfired. Uh, I was down with the game. I... I didn't see any in-game management at all from any Wexford player. I, tactically speaking, I didn't know what was going on with their cookouts because they were they were basically had had Foley and another cornerback to say inside the 45. Clare regressed. The Wexford had three guys three guys in the middle and they sent off the wing backs, but the puckets were going short. The wing backs were shooting up the wings, and the ball was getting turned over. Let's say inside their own 65, so they were actually minus two defenders. It made absolutely no sense whatsoever for what what they were trying to do, and Clare just absolutely pouncing it. They got how many scores did they get in the first 15 with penetrating runs through uh, having overlapping numbers because Rex were down a couple of a couple of defenders, you know. And again, similarly, uh, we talk about the breaks in the Tip Limerick game. That's how Cotton Malone got his goal, you know. And they just they just clear, clear were far hungry. They, they, you got you got the sense that they were they were really ravenous, you know what I mean? The way they were going for the ball, hunting the ball. The clear crowd, I think, you know, that they they deserve to be to be applauded too because of the lift they gave their team. When a free was won, Clare were shouting. When you know, a pint was going over, they were going crazy. And when the goal went in, they lost their minds entirely. You know, so and they get they gave great energy to the Clare guys. Um, but it's just it, it was just there was I think it was tactical in, inadequacies, uh, especially from their own puck out, because uh Clare got an awful lot of primary position and secondary position off the Wexford puck out. Um, it was an element of work rate that Wexford didn't meet, didn't they didn't go towards to Clare whatsoever. They they just kind of lied against the ropes and tried to take every punch from Clare and it didn't it didn't work for them. And then it was a case of just energy. Um, like when things would go wrong, it's set. Like you're, if your energy level is at 100% at the start of the game and you keep getting blow by blow because your system isn't working and the opposition is, is, is getting run, yeah, your energy drops off and you become lethargic. You know, and you know, that's kind of, that was the story of the first half, really. And how did they get back into the game then? Uh, well, your man came down the sideline and he started roaring and shouting and trying to G up, lads, like whatever. But I think every team has a purple patch um, you know, or could have numerous purple patches in games. Clear's purple patch was obviously the first quarter. Um, I think the water break came at a great time for Wexford. They got to re, like they got they rejigged their, their 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 structure a small bit and kind of went more orthodox and poke outs. Um, and they stopped messing inside in the middle with, with trying to get short passing. And they got Cahill Dunbar on the ball. Cahill Dunbar got shot five points in play, let's say, and and did um did wonders for the shooting. And they got a roll. They got a roll against Clear, and then they got energy. You know, I talk about you. You can see the team and say when you get a point for two points or a couple points to roll. You know, your, your energy levels increase, your adrenaline increases, and next thing you, it's like a snowball effect. It gets, it gets bigger and bigger, you know what I mean? And Clare didn't stop it. They didn't try to delay it, try to stop it, try to start to row, do something, just to break the whole chain, uh, you know, uh, chain of play for, for Wexford. And well, half time came too soon for Wexford. They could have kept going um, because Clare were, again, they had put so much into the first quarter. They were lacking the energy in the kind of the last 10 minutes. When O'Keefe got the goal, you know, they, they hit six points after that, five of which were unanswered. And they just uh, they got a, a good run. Their proper patch was excellent, but that was it. That was it. Then they kind of petered out. And um, now they did win the second half by two points, you know. But essentially, the damage was done in the first half. And you know, I suppose that last goal was more of a consolation goal than actually 
you know, minimising the margin of three points. Yeah. Um, Sherlock Nan suggested that from Wexford's perspective, this is in his uh, column at the Star at the weekend, that it's time for them to, to get somebody else in. Uh, yeah. He was talking about Eddie Brennan being somebody who would be perfect for, for Wexford. And, you know, further to the conversation we were having the last time, the importance of somebody understanding your culture and coming from within your culture, it's notable that Wexford's greatest ex ever success had a Wexford man at the helm. So maybe, maybe they don't need another outside manager. Eddie Brennan yeah. did a really good job with Leash. So maybe, yeah. maybe he is right. But is it time for that group of players to, to have somebody else calling the tune and inspiring them on to what's next? 100 percent. A million percent, uh, absolutely, because they they've won they've won five out of fifteen games in four years from their tenure, and in those five games, there were uh, three of them were against Carlo, Offaly, and Westmeath. You know they've only beaten Dublin and Kilkenny, top tier opposition. You know so has and Kilkenny was the Leinster final. So I know I'm being a bit disingenuous here, or a bit, bit negative. But put the Kilkenny game aside for a second, and has their 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 his tenure been a success? No, it hasn't. Do you know what I mean? Like the. So it's time for the players. They need a reju rejuvenation because every time they go out, uh, out of the championship or knocked out or beaten, let's say, they're always beaten comprehensively. You know, I mean, they're always beaten by. Like, I know three points was the last day, but it was it felt like six or seven. You know, um, when they got knocked out against Clare last year, it was seven. When they got knocked beaten by Galway in the championship last year, it was eight or nine. You know, and I just think that the, the Wexford players they deserve more. They deserve to be rejuvenated with a new manager, with a fresh impetus, a new tactical approach, more energy, more positive energy. And uh, and see what they can get out of it, you know. Because like you're looking at guys, Colin McDonald, Lee Chin, Matthew Hannon, How long do they have? Let's say at a, at a top level, because the, the age the age gap is coming down the whole time. So how long have they got left? And like if you have a golden generation of Wexford players, you want to you want to utilise them as best possible for success. So I think they do need a change. Is is an in-house change uh, with the Wexford person? I, I don't know. You know, I I think Eddie Brennan would be a great shout. I think he did a great job at Leash, and I think the work he actually did with Leash uh, transferred over to their performance this year against Watford. You know. And that can't that, 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 that can't go on site. So, uh, to answer your question, yes, a change is needed in Wexford. Okay, I, just there was an interesting point you made there about um, not being able to stop the purple patch, and it kind of speaks a little bit to what happened in the Tipperary game as well. Andy McEntee, in the aftermath of the uh, Dublin Meath match, was lamenting the fact that a, a couple of the dubs seemed to be very badly injured at one stage. They were down in the ground. You know, he, he, he wished them well in their recovery and hoped that they would be okay afterwards. It was clearly tongue-in-cheek. He was making the point that Meath were on a roll and Dublin very smartly managed the game or it's gamesmanship or it's blatant cheating, depending on your viewpoint on this. But every good team in history uh, has had a, a, a call or a signal to say, right, we're, we're up against it, we're under the cosh, you go down there, I'm going to go down here, the referee's <coughs> going to be a bit distracted and we're going to buy ourselves a bit of breathing space and a bit of, a bit of time to think our yeah. way through this. Did Tipperary yes. need? Could they have done that to stop Limerick in any way? Or was... absolutely, they should. Have, they should have done the old one with the take off the helmet and pretend you're contact lenses. You know, they should have done that one uh, after after break after the end of a play. So if Limerick had a wide or a score, especially a score, goalie, take off your helmet, go down on your ground, uh, pretend you're contact lenses. You know, lie down, do something. Uh, anyone out, out the field, just start to fight. <laughs> you know, start to route, start something, and and transfer energy from Limerick over to something else. You know what I mean? Because when a team is, is on the tendency and they're looking to, to close a gap, they want everything to go at their pace, which is 100 mile an hour because they're clutching for time. They need time, they need time. When a team is trying to do the opposite, you want to go in slow mo. You know, you want for everything to go really slow, puck outs, free sidelines, and try to frustrate the opposition as much as you can. So I understand what Andy McEntee was saying, but we're dropping right to do it 100%. Go down, just do something. And every team does it. And if a, if a team says they don't, it's absolute bull. Uh, every team does it because they understand under the cosh and they've got to stop the rot. You know, uh, because it just things are rotten too badly, and the same with Tipperary on Sunday, they just needed to do something, you know. And I just say that at home and I say in the club, just do something, you know. If that's, I don't know, uh, just tackle the fella, pull him down for some reason, <laughs> no reason whatsoever, and just see, to, see what you can. Can you transfer energy from Limerick over to something else? You know what I mean? Even take a referee's focus and kill a minute or two of the game, and kill a minute or two of the half, you know. Is this something that you would have talked about when you were playing, or is it actually, you know, it's, it, I guess it has to be learned, right? No, no, no team is born with this in them. They, the game smarts, the management of situations, part of it is experience, part of it is coaching, yeah. and, and it's just making sure that somebody within the system is thinking that if this scenario arises, and it will at some point over the course of the season, we've practiced it, we've spoken about it, we've understood exactly, okay, this is what we're doing. And, you know, with the Dublin football team, for example, there's the famous kick-out where uh, 
Mayo have the ball on the tee and five separate Mayo players are dragged to the ground by their opposite number by the dubs and Dublin win the All-Ireland and afterwards nobody really speaks about it. But it's an amazing piece of concerted thinking by the Dublin forwards in particular to prevent Mayo from getting a quick kick out to get the ball back into play. And I think yeah. I think ultimately the kick out ends up going over the sideline anyway. So it was a wasted opportunity. Yeah. But like that team was bloody smart and that's why they're going for seven in a row this year. Uh, yeah. Is that is that something that when you were playing with Galway, there were, those conversations would have happened? Yeah, I, I think even you go back way further. <clears throat> Every team, uh, you'll plan for this, you know. So it, we, you, you'll have days where you're facing a team that you know you're kind of up against. You might not exactly have the same, you know, balance of power that they have. So if you were, for example, playing Kilkenny in the in the mid two thousands or the early tens, you know, they 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 had a better team than everybody. So like you don't want them to get a roll. You have to stop it, but it's one thing planning for it and, and talking about it pre-game or pre-in training, but to actually execute it and for the for the the player or players to have the in-game you know smarts to do it under pressure, it, it might sound like actually a small thing, you know, just take off your helmet or you know lie down or something, but to do that under pressure and not conform to the actual game for the ref to blow on the whistle, come on, pick it up, the umpire is telling you fuck it out, you know what I mean? For you to actually sit down and lie down, it takes experience, it takes a bit of balls too, you know what I mean? Because you're risking. A throw in, you're risking, you know, a free against you or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Or you're risking time added on. But you're right, it's it comes with experience. It comes with a, probably a senior member of the team doing it, uh, whether that be in the goals or out the field. And it's uh, it's terribly important to, 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 to break momentum because, like, we, we touched on purple patches there, Joe. Like, when a team has a purple patch, you've got to stop it. You don't let the you, teams actually don't realize they're, they're against a purple patch until they've three or four points scored against them in five minutes. Do you know what I mean? And at that stage, then you want to come completely stop. You don't want that to keep going for 10 minutes and have them score eight or nine points. So there's a lot of in-game, you know, uh, thoughts going through. And like, it's again, it's, it goes back to my point about Keane Lynch and the self-talk. You know, it's 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 huge in a player. And, and nowadays players, like, especially senior senior kind of players, is they'll understand what's going on in the now, in the now. And they understand that, 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 that when teams have a run, we've got to stop it. You know, we've got, we've got to kind of bring it down. So the good teams, like the Dublin, the Limerick's will do it as well, I guarantee you. And, and you know, at the Galways and, and, and Tiberi, Tiberi should have done it and you see what didn't happen to him. But it's uh, it's not something you're practised for. You know, it's not. It's it's something that you just, you you know, you're taught since a young guy, you know, and it's just having the balls to do it in real time. Yeah, and and uh, you, you talked about um, that swing and, it, you know, just thinking about it now, like, I haven't seen as big a swing in, uh, in a match except... You guys in 2012, in one way, where the trilogy of games you have with Kilkenny, there's a swing from the first game where you're, you are absolutely dominant to the third game where they're absolutely dominant. What, yeah. what happens? How, how, does, how, does, how does the balance of power shift so spectacularly? Uh, a couple of teams. I think on, on, on the first game, you were probably re referencing the Leinster final in 12. And that was, uh, look, it was probably an element of complacency from Kilkenny too. Uh, we were 7-1 to one to win the game. So there was no public expectation whatsoever. So we were starting at the bottom of the barrel, you know, and we just came out and just blew them away and just saw the game out. The game was at a different stage then as it was as it was as it was now. So there was no huge long range shooting. There was no you know thirty points. So let's say if you kept relatively kept the goals uh, out, you know, you were going to see see a game through if you're up by seven or eight. Um, and then let's say in 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 the first game of the Ireland final series, then we we should have been up six six at half time. We committed a couple of fouls. We actually went in three up at half time. And then it was just like the Kinnear began to turn the wheel, and at the end of the, of the first Ireland final, we got a draw to snatch, snatch a, we got a free to snatch a draw, and you could just feel the energy was going, and the balance of power was shifting towards Kilkenny. and like once, once you knew that as a Galway person, you know, as a Galway player, it's very hard to stop. Do you know what I mean? Because we we have had succumbed to defeats from Kilkenny from a lot, of, a lot of years previous, and you know. I think Kikini got that too. They smelt a bit of blood and they finished off the job on the second early practically. Is there something now, if you could go back and explain to the team, knowing everything you know, that would be able to change that from the, the, the replay to the, from the drawing game to the replay? Yeah, I think it's opportunities. Like we, you know, we, we had an awful lot of shots in the first, in the first All-Ireland whereby, um, you know, they were probably taken sort of rashly, you know, they 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 could have been phased better, let's say. And this this is us, this is me looking back in hindsight now, you know, which is easy for me to do. But it like there's, there's there's a few shots, five or six that come to my memory, and that like if there was just an extra pass or extra five yards ran, 
the opportunity really became much easier. We could attack down a point or two more and probably cut, even close the game out. Um, we didn't concede a goal that day, but we, we kind of let Sheffield run right a bit, you know what I mean? I think we should probably tactically change up things a small bit and see if we uh, cut out his you know, his influence. And he he, he references it too as his most, his most influential performance in Kenny Jersey, which is kind of, it's hard enough to hear, you know what I mean? But it's true, you know, so just face the fact he, that was his best game he said he had for Kenny. And uh, you, you, again, you felt that in time, which was so hard to stop. You know what I mean? So hard. I guess that's the thing that makes Keen Lynch, Keen Lynch, and Shefflin, Shefflin, is that we know what they're going to do. The whole world knows it. The whole world has a plan to try and stop it. And yes, nothing you do actually yeah. ends up being able to stop it. You said it. You said it a moment ago when you were on about is there a blueprint to beat Limerick? And you said, can we man mark Keen Lynch? If some guy man marks Keen Lynch for seventy minutes, he's going to get sent off. He's going to get sent off. Because Lynch is going to keep moving. You're going to keep fouling him and dragging him. That's why John McCormick had to off him. Uh, because he's going to get sent off. You're going to come, come, uh, commit re repetitive fouls. So, like, you, you just can't. You know what I mean? And we could have stayed fouling Sheffield all day that day, but someone's going to get the line in. You know what I mean? It's just when they're in that groove, that calibre of player, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, we man mark them. You know, but that's, 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 the, that's the easy thing to say. The hard thing to do is can you cut off the supply to entirely? That's the hard thing. That's where teams should be focused is. Instead of focusing on Keen Lynch, you can try to limit his influence as much as you can with the runner beside him. But can you stop the ball getting to him? That's the real key. Stop him. Okay. I spent a good bit more time on, on some of that stuff, but it was really interesting. What's the story in Galway? What's the, the sense? How, how is the team going? What do you think is, is a likely outcome at the weekend? Yeah, I know you were asked me that. It's kind of, it was it's radio silence in Galway. I haven't heard a bit of any player. <laughs> You know, it's gas. I think they just the it's it's business. You know, uh, the, the the Dublin game now is well and truly forgotten. Um, I think they have to shackles over the last couple of weeks in training. Um, they're primed to go now. I think there's there's a bite about them. Um, I I I think they're gonna they've obviously drawn Watford. They're going they're gonna come through Watford. Um, because just with it's going to be a kickback off the Dublin game, and this is the game where they're kind of going to set a record straight. And uh, they're going to I think they're going to come with huge energy. Uh, they're going to come with with the with the real aggression, you know, that they didn't show against Dublin, they're going to take scores early, and I think they're going to see out Waterford. Um, it's it's I well, Galway for this game are probably in a good place. Um, it's just it's it's the, it's, the, it's what worries me. Looking down the line is the role of games coming so soon against top level opposition. If they come through Waterford, uh, they'll most likely face you know Tipperary because they faced Dublin early. Uh, if they come through Tipperary, they'll most likely face Limerick. You know what I mean? And if they come through them, they could, they could face a Kilkenny type team. You know so. So from now to the Holy Grail is going to be a very, very hard quest. Um, but I think just from step one, take it day by day. And I think just go at Watford, hit them with everything you have to say, and be aggressive, be up front, and, and the rest will take, take care of itself. OK. I, it, it's interesting because that's kind of what you said would happen uh, after the Dublin game. We asked, you know, what, what will training be like? And it sounds like it was exactly as you've expected. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, like it, it was never going to be a walk in the park and, and they're just going to put the hands around each other and say, it'll be fine, it'll be all right, you know. It's not going to, like, you have to kind of fix it. So we have a problem. Uh, the problem was, was evident against Dublin, a couple of problems. Uh, they were well spoken about. They are well analysed, let's say, in-house. So now fix the problem. And and we, when you do all the, the training to, to fix this problem, the only way you really put it to bed and fix it and put the Dublin game behind you is go out and, and hit Watford hard. That's that's the only way you do it. You know what I mean? And that really put to bed any uh, issues that you've had with Dublin. That'll, that'll confirm that what you've done in training worked. You know what I mean? And, and that, that the guys are back, back, Back in, in sync again. They just they've, they've a bump on the road, obviously, and they're off the trail a bit. Now the Watford game is a perfect opportunity to come back on, you know. And the, the Clare Cork game, do Clare carry everything that they have, and does that give them an advantage against Cork? Or is I mean, I, it's I just don't know where Cork are at the moment. It's it's the great unknown yeah. of the Irish sports summer. It's extremely hard to tell. Like you know, the forwards aren't fired, in, you know, like Hoggy Patrick Hogan is not fired, in, you know, Harland is not fired. In. And you're wondering, let's say, where the big score is going to come from. Um, Clare are going to bring energy from the off. Um, how much energy they have is a big, big concern for me. Um, because they've, like, they've, they've effectively, I know they haven't, but it's nearly like three weeks, three, it's nearly like they're playing three games in a row, if you get me, even though, you know, in, in three weeks. So it's, if Cork can, I suppose, keep Clare at, at, at arm's length for the first 15 minutes, that will go a long way to Cork winning the game. You do want to give Clare ascendancy from the off, because you would, just, you would assume that if you can hit them hard, from the off, that their energy levels would drop, that the motivation would drop to say if they're not getting the, the, the scores and the fruition that they had against Wexford and that you could see them off. Um, I'm I'm back in Cork in this one solely because Cork has had a break. Clare have, have had to have you know a couple of heavy battles over the last couple of weeks. And uh, I saw Shannon her like uh, Aaron Shannon her and John Conlon, they were 
they were coming off gingerly at the last day. Uh, I don't know what kind of damage they've done or have they any injuries. So it's, they, they're coming out of one battle into the next one. And I spoke as well about how it's so hard to get up for a game one weekend and then go through the game uh, physically and mentally, come down from that game, uh, put it to bed, analyse it, and get back up again for the next game. That's, that's the big challenge for the players. Physically, you can recover you know, quite fast with, with the aid of third parties like physios and water, etc. But mentally, it's all on you, you know, and can Clare wipe the, 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 the game from last week and get right back up again for Cork and start off uh, where they left off against Wexford? That's the big challenge. James, good stuff. Brilliant this morning. Thanks a million for joining us.